You're listening to the Catholic Fragments Podcast, where we explore the treasures of Catholicism, the fullness of truth revealed in Jesus Christ and His Church. I'm your host, Dr. Donald Wallenfang, and I invite you to join me in gathering up the fragments of the truth that sets us free. pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. A reading from the book of Exodus, chapter 3. Now Moses, tending the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, drove the flock into the wilderness, and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire out of a bush. He gazed, and there was a bush all aflame. Yet the bush was not consumed. Moses said, I must turn aside to look at this marvelous sight. Why doesn't the bush burn up? When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to look, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. He answered, Here I am. And he said, Do not come closer. Remove the sandals from your feet for the place on which you stand is holy ground. I am, he said, the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. And the Lord continued, I have marked well the plight of my people in Egypt, and have heeded their outcry because of their taskmasters, Yes, I am mindful of their sufferings. I have come down to rescue them from the Egyptians and to bring them out of the land to a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the region of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Now the cry of the Israelites has reached me. Moreover, I have seen how the Egyptians oppress them. Come, therefore, I will send you to Pharaoh, and you shall free my people, the Israelites, from Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and free the Israelites from Egypt? And he said, I will be with you. That shall be your sign that it was I who sent you. And when you have freed the people from Egypt, you shall worship God at this mountain. Moses said to God, When I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, Eheye asher eheye, I am who I am. He continued, Thus shall you say to the Israelites, Eheye. I am, sent me to you. And God said further to Moses, Thus shall you speak to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This shall be my name forever. This my appellation for all eternity. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. St. Thomas Aquinas, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hello everyone, a great joy to be with you on this edition this episode of the Catholic Fragments Podcast. I'm Dr. Donald Wallenfang, and today we feature St. Thomas Aquinas and his classic demonstration proving, essentially rationally proving, the existence of God. It's a very important point in theology and philosophy, first of all, to demonstrate 
with reason that God exists. It is called a preamble of faith. That is, it's something that we deal with before moving on to all of the various tenets of the creed, all of the aspects of God's revelation beyond the capacities that reason could discover. So it's a preamble of faith to demonstrate rationally that God exists, that there is God. It's a paradoxical question, though, because to say something exists means that it stands out in its being. We could say from a backdrop of all-encompassing being. So God doesn't exist like we creatures exist because we stand out in our being from the ground of being that is God. So God does not stand out in God's being from anything else. As St. Thomas will say, God is, in Latin, ipsum esse subsistens, self-subsisting being itself, being itself. Ipsum esse, being itself. So I want to look in this episode of the Catholic Fragments Podcast at these classic ways, rational ways for us to come to as much reasonable certainty as possible that God is, God is real. But if we ask the question about is something real, is this or that real, it's always in reference to the really real, that is God. So again, it's a great paradox to try to demonstrate rationally the existence of God. God's existence, which is the very necessary condition of possibility for us demonstrating anything else that is real or not real. So it's really pretentious of us human beings as creatures to ask this question at all because we're really... Uh, comparing God to our own being instead of the other way around. (laughs) It's really God who should be asking us, do you exist? (laughs) But we return the favor uh, because God did give us being. So let us look at St. Thomas Aquinas in his Summa Theologiae, question two, the question, does God exist? I'm going to jump around a little here. It is so rich, so incredible. For me, it's one of the most convincing texts in the whole tradition of Catholic philosophy and theology, reassuring us of the reality of God whenever we might doubt this reality. And it's easy to doubt the reality of God because we cannot wrap our minds around God by definition. God even as a concept, let alone divine being, life, love, everything else about God, saturates our mental capacities, our cognitive process, by definition. So St. Thomas asks, within this bigger question, does God exist? He asks, is it self-evident that God exists? Which is to say, Shouldn't it be self-evident to every human being uh, who is able to think about these things that God exists? Why do we even question this? And ultimately, he argues, it is not self-evident that God exists. Because what is self-evident, he says, is when someone knows both the essence of the subject and the predicate in a proposition. An example of this is something like, the whole is greater than the part. We know something about a whole. We know the meaning of a whole. We also know the meaning of a part. And we know something about the relationship between the two. It would not make sense to say The part is greater than the whole. That would be a rational contradiction. And it's self-evident, the relation of the whole and part. But the issue with God is that to say God exists is that we know something about 
existence because we have a share in it, but we don't know fully what God is. It is virtually impossible for our finite minds to think the infinite adequately. And moreover, what is God? Philosophically speaking, we would define God as existence itself, being itself. So that the essence of God, what God is, is existence. The essence of what we are is human. We might say an individual substance of a rational nature, to quote that early philosopher Boethius, but St. Thomas says that God's existence needs to be demonstrated by things more known to us, namely by God's effects. So we as creatures with these finite minds cannot know God in God's essence, directly, immediately, self-evidently, but we can demonstrate that God exists, that God is real, by starting with these creaturely effects and working our way back to their cause. So this is what St. Saint Saint Thomas Aquinas does in his five distinct demonstrations of the existence of God. So this moves into Article 3 under Question 2 of uh, the first part of his Summa. And St. Thomas begins with the passage we heard in our prayer from Exodus chapter 3, God revealing himself to Moses in this theophany, this incredible phenomenon of this bush, the shrub at Mount Horeb that was aflame but not combusting, not being consumed. And we heard even in the prayer, the Hebrew, Eheye Asher Eheye, I am who I am. St. Thomas, based on this biblical revelation of God, at least this kind of biblical revelation that throws light on the rational demonstration of God's existence, he begins here and says there's five ways in which we can prove that there is God. The first and most obvious way, he says, is based on change, in Latin, motus. We could also say motion, closely related, but as a general concept, change. It is certain and clear to our senses that some things in the world undergo change, but anything in process of change is changed by something else. For nothing can be undergoing change unless it is potentially whatever it ends up being after its process of change. While something causes change insofar as it is actual in some way. After all, to change something is simply to bring it from potentiality to actuality. And this can only be done by something that is somehow already actual. But something cannot be simultaneously actually X and potentially X, though it can be actually X and potentially Y. So something in process of change cannot itself cause that same change. It cannot change itself. Necessarily, therefore, anything in process of change is changed by something else. And if this is the case, we then reason with St. Thomas all the way back to the beginning of this series of, we could say, intermediate causes and effects, back to an original, primary, uncaused cause. So this distinction between act and potency. God exists, therefore, because God is the first cause of change. Nothing that changes is changed by itself, but rather is changed by something else. For example, a butterfly cannot potentially be a butterfly because it already is one. However, a caterpillar can potentially be a butterfly because it has not yet become one. For this change from caterpillar to butterfly to take place, much is needed besides the caterpillar itself. For example, nutrition, hydration. And moreover, that 
a genetic metaphysical blueprint of metamorphosis within the caterpillar from its conception onward that the caterpillar is destined to become butterfly because it's written in the internal script of its being you could say and what put that there what put that causality even the genetic causality the environmental causality to permit and enable the caterpillar to become butterfly that which is subject to change cannot be the logical cause of its own existence change does not cause change but simply describes the movement from cause to effect a cause effects change and therefore change that transition from potency to act is not eternal and is not being itself ipsum esse which defines divine being being itself all creatures everything we encounter in the physical universe and the finite spiritual universe is a being has a participation in existence but is not existence itself is not being itself but god is it is necessary to distinguish between primary cause that is god and secondary causes all that fills the universe that god made and that god causes to cause and to be affected it's necessary to make this distinction just as it is necessary to differentiate between being itself and beings primary cause and being itself are not of the same order as secondary causes and beings if change is produced by a series of intermediate causes we necessarily must seize upon a first primary cause that sets the series of secondary causes in motion and this first uncaused cause that which is pure act with no admixture of potency that which is not subject to change we call god so this is just the first of the five rational demonstrations st thomas gives of god's existence the reality of god's uncaused being and because i try to keep these podcast episodes to about 20 minutes or so i don't have time to go through the next 2 3 4 5 demonstrations st thomas gives maybe on future episodes but this at least what's the appetite for learning more for reading more these demonstrations can be accessed online and also i'm taking some of this commentary from a book i published back in the year 2019 called metaphysics a basic introduction in a christian key this is from chapter 3 uh the chapter on causality but i want to conclude the podcast with a couple minutes left reading further from this chapter of this book i wrote on metaphysics it's meant to be a beginner's introduction to the philosophical school called metaphysics perennial philosophy the bedrock of catholic philosophy for sure and i invite you to have a closer look at that book i'll put a link in the description of the podcast but i want to turn to a more recent saint greatly influenced by saint thomas aquinas who has been featured in a previous podcast episode named saint edith stein and i want to add a additional rational proof of god's existence from her work. So Edith Stein has this insight about the finite ego, the I am, in relation to the eternal divine ego, the great I am, the uncreated I am. And in her work she's really unpacking the metaphysics of St. Thomas Aquinas who relies heavily on the metaphysical deliberations of aristotle and she reasons this way as a person i am i do not merely exist but am mindful of the existence that i am and that others especially other personal egos selves are yet at the same time i am acutely aware that i am not there was a time i was not and the time is coming when i will not be what i am as i am also i am not yet what i will be this much is clear to personal conscious life nevertheless i am 
I am a radically transient being, and without a doubt, I am not being itself. I am not synonymous with existence itself, like God is. My being is essentially received being. My I am is a received I am, personally received from an eternally personal I am. By myself, I am nothing. But from the great I am, the divine I am, and because of the divine I am, I am me. Divine I am is actual and my I am has been actualized. I did not posit my own existence out of nothing, nor do I sustain it over and against nothing. Someone else punctuated me into being and sustains my being at every moment. With reference to St. Thomas's fourth proof of the existence of God, the ego life is more akin to the plentitude of divine being in comparison with impersonal beings because its presence lasts in relation to a much greater dissipation of being than that of its own. That is to say, my, my ego life, my I am, lasts through the course of all these various events, all these changes of my physical body. And so this I am, this recognition of the self, really is the centerpiece of what we mean by the imago dei, being created in the image of God. I'm not just a transient organism that comes and goes, but there's a stability of my I, of myself, through it all. Just as God subsists as the immutable, unchangeable, personal stability of the instability of creation, the ego life subsists as stable conscious agency all while the contents of consciousness remain in rapid flux. So the heart of the Imago Dei is detected here. Affinity for the infinity of being. That plenitude of personal being we call love. And this love is revealed as that sheltering hold of my own being, my I am, that despite its radical transience, is sustained and held in its being from moment to moment like a child in her mother's arms. Because my being is held in being by another who is not identical to the being that is my own, I am. The one who holds me alone cannot not be. However, it is possible for me not to be. In fact, there once was a time, most of the time, when I was not. What I am becoming, I do not entirely know. If there is received being, there must be given being, being given, the cause of all beginning. This cause must be one because if it were many, one deity would lack qualities that another deity possessed and vice versa. And the one and only deity that is, as being itself, cannot be divided into multiple beings themselves, for who would hold the being of the other in its mutually contingent being? Yet it is possible, and in fact must be actual, that there would be a personal multiplicity in this eternal unified ego life, that is, the Trinitarian personal substance of being itself. For who would there be to love if there was only one solitary lover with no one else to love? I am because we are, because we are, therefore I am, to quote the great African proverb at the end of this reflection. So perhaps this podcast episode is a little more than you bargained for, but <laughs> this is the nature of our intellectual life. It's very deep. The anchor goes into an abyss. That is uncreated divine being, being itself. And it is a sheer joy to share these reflections with you in this podcast episode Thanks to St. Thomas Aquinas and St. Edith Stein for helping us to come into contact with these insights that feed our life of faith. Thank you for joining me on the Catholic Fragments podcast, where you are equipped to think toward the whole, to pray from the heart, and to live as a witness.